baritones are often an underappreciated voice type, uh, but they're found in almost every opera, and their characters are crucial and often essential drivers to many operatic plots. Today's program will delve into how composers use the baritone and bass baritone voices as the antagonist to propel the story forward. Unfortunately, Natalie Mann, who produced this, this program and did a wonderful job yesterday, uh, has taken ill today and is not able to join us today. But thankfully, we have a presenter who is more than comfortable taking over for Natalie as he is a longtime educator as well as an award-winning singer. Doug Nagel is a bass baritone and founding director of Coachella Valley Classical Voices. Today, he'll be performing alongside local pianist Bruce Mangum. Please help me welcome to the stage Mr. Doug Nagel. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome, everyone. I was scheduled to be on this program anyway, and Natalie and I have been talking about taking this show on the road, so it was great. I had no trouble filling in today, and I thought, especially since I'm talking about the baritone voice, I would, of course, offer no opinions about that voice type, I mean, at all. And actually, what's really interesting about the baritone voice is Today, I'm singing three different types of voices. I'm singing a bass arias, bass baritone arias, and a baritone aria. So all the voice types of the lower male voice. So what is a baritone sound? Do you think it's higher or lower? Well, baritone is the most common voice type in men's voices versus a bass or a tenor. The history of the baritone. Its Greek meaning is means heavy sound. First noted in the 15th century, the term baritone was used to describe the lowest voice in the 15th century. Basses took that over. I think it's actually all the men who were out too late and smoked cigars and their voices dropped because it's what happens to the bass voice. All my bass friends in the opera world, they'd go to the cantina during, during break and they'd be smoking away and I'm like, how can you do that? And they're like, because. <laughs> okay. Baritone took the range they currently have um, now in the 18th century, but were really not separated distinctly as basses until the 19th century. Many singers were then called bass baritones. Why do composers need baritones? Well, <laughs> let me tell you. The tenor can't have all the good stuff. I mean, come on. Critical voice for ensemble singing, generally the lowest voice in the ensemble, the trio, quartet, which would have you. Important to have a variety of colors to express emotion. You, do you see how the lower voice could be perceived as the bad guy or the mean guy? <laughs> okay, it's going to be that today. <laughs> that's, that's excellent. That's an excellent response. One of my favorite baritones, actually, she's got a picture up of Dmitry Hordvorsky, and he died of brain cancer too young, so if you ever Google him or YouTube him, um, Dmitry Hordvorsky, he's, oh my God, he was great. He sang all the big Verdi roles. He sang Eugene Onegin opposite Rene Fleming at the Met. And it was, he was just a, he was a great guy, a really wonderful colleague. Um, but I digress. Today's lecture will focus on five operas from various time periods and composers. Just like yesterday, if, if you were here yesterday, that's how Natalie has positioned this lecture. Each opera will discuss 
will be discussed using five major characteristics. The composer, what was the style of the composition when the composer lived? The plot, what story is being told dramatically? The character, what challenges does the character face in the opera? The aria, which is the, aria is the solo word in opera for a song. What is the importance of the plot? And the music structure. Are there specific melodies or harmonies or structures to listen to? And we'll give you a little something to listen to from each one before we perform it. So first up, so we talked about all that. So composer, plot, character, aria, musical structure. First up is the Barbara Seville, Il Barbieri di Siviglia. And it's by Giacchino Antonio Rossini. And Mr. Rossini was from 1792 to 1868. He wrote 39 operas. But you probably know, he's famous for an overture, and you probably know, you know the William Tell Overture. Do you know how that one goes? Is it Bugs Bunny? Is that right? da 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 That's Barbara Seville. So what's the William Tell? Lone Ranger, right, exactly, yes. So, see, you probably knew a lot about opera before you knew a lot about opera. <laughs> and uh, the, Barbara Seville is an opera buffa, and that is, means it's a comic opera from 1816. The plot is by a play by Beaumarchais. And the Barbara Seville was a, was a plot used by other composers, but Rossini had the good tunes, so his is most famous. Count Almaviva has fallen in love, by the way, the Count's a tenor, just saying, <laughs> has fallen in love with Rosina, the ward of Dr. Bartolo, a base. So see, they're not all bad guys. They might be dads or wards, or fathers or uncles, or all the above. Figaro claims that he can help the Count to woo his love and gain access to her. Now, we all know the character of Figaro. Figaro, Figaro, Figaro. He's the Mr. Catch-all. He kind of, he's the glue between the relationships. So everybody loves that aria, and everybody remembers singing it or singing around the house. My mother had it on when she was cleaning. Um, it, it's, it's good to clean the house, by the way. It ke keeps the energy up. So you didn't know you'd be getting housekeeping tips today, right? Imagine that. Anyway, back to the plot. Dr. Bartolo realizes that the Count and Rosina are in love, so he employs a music teacher for Rosina named Don Basilio. And this is where Rossini was good, because he would bring in some character who would talk about nothing and have this great tune and talk about air and sand and being quiet and making noise. And it would be such a musical masterpiece that you didn't really, you, you knew the Italian was happening, but you didn't need to know every word. And so Dr. Basilio was friends with Bartolo and he is, he is brought into the plot to try to distract the couple to split them up, which of course doesn't really happen. It backfires on Bartolo. And this is in the aria, La Calunia. There's more pictures of Barbara Seville. While Dr. Bartolo is designed, is, is, has designs on Marion Rosina, Figaro actually ends up helping the Count and Rosina, and it all ends happily, and Bartolo's just a little curbudgeony about it all, and he's, he's all right in the end. So the character that I'm, from the aria that I'm going to sing is that funny guy, Don Basilio. And he's the one who will help Dr. Bartolo. The role has been pro portrayed by many famous, famous basses from Giroff to Cesar Sieppi to Paul Plischka, um, oh, the, I could, the, name, the names go on. A uh, Fulanetto was one I, used, I saw at San Francisco Opera. Um, 
and he sang at many places, many, many, many places. Uh, while Dr. Bartolo is old and is old and curmudgeony, Basilio is the darker character who is looking out for his own good. La Calunia de Aria tells how Don Basilio will outwit the Count by spreading rumors and ruining his reputation. The aria describes how false statements can progress from a quiet buzz of speculation to an all-destroying cannon blow. Musical notes as the Rossini crescendo. So it really, Rossini was a master at this. He would start real soft, and it build and it build and it build, sort of like you're on, you know. You're in a horse race, and you're on the horses, and the horse is going, and it gets bigger and bigger, and, and that's the excitement that you feel from the audience. And you didn't even have to know what the words were, because often all, every character on stage is singing different words. So there's no way any super title screen could let you see all of what's going on. The slander will start with a whisper, and then the phrase is repeated. So you'll notice I repeat a lot of words, but you try to repeat them as you build the crescendo, which is the music getting bigger. Note the precise articulation needed in the aria to get the sounds to sound like the words they are. So will you play a little clip from what they're going to hear for us, please? Bruce Magnum, everyone. So what he would do is he would take a phrase like that, and you notice that the piano went up, and it came back down. But I'll be singing just like this. So one person, so either the orchestra's playing like this, and my voice is going like this, or vice versa. And that's a, a trait with Rossini in all of his arias. And so now I will sing for you La Calunia from Il Barbieri di Siviglia. <clears throat> La calunia Open the cielo Una uretta Assai gente Tile, che insensibile e sottile, leggermente e dolcemente, incomincia, incomincia, su, su, rara. Piano, piano. Sotto voce, <laughs> terra, terra, <laughs> similando, va scorrendo, va scorrendo, va lontano, va ronzando, nell'orecchia delle gente. Si introduce, si introduce destramente E le teste di cervelli, e le teste di cervelli Fa stordite, fa stordite, fa stordite, fa gionfiare Dalla bocca fuori uscendo Lo schiamazzo va crescendo Pronto a terza poco a poco <laughs> Vola già tre loco in loco Tempra dentro per pesta La tempesta ne foresta E fioscando pronto fiondo E pronto don gelare Alla finga pronta putta Se la propria se la doppia E produce un'esplosione Come un altro di cannone Come un'altra di cannone, 
trovi moto temporale, non trovi moto temporale, un tu molto generale che fa l'aria a ritmo bar, non trovi moto temporale, non trovi moto temporale, un tu molto generale che fa l'aria a ritmo bar. Ehi, meschino, calunniato, avvilito, che stato sotto il pubblico fragello per gran sorte va crepor e meschino calunniato a vilito calpestato sotto Tu il pubblico fra cielo e gran sorte va a crepar. Sotto il pubblico fra cielo per gran sorte va a crepar. Sotto il pubblico fra cielo per gran sorte va a crepar. Si va a crepar, si va a crepar, si va a crepar. Now we move from Rossini to Mozart. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, 1756 to 1791. And I'm going to confess something to you all, okay? This is confession day. I hadn't seen the movie Amadeus. And my husband said, you know, you haven't seen it? You haven't seen it? And we watched it, and I fell all in love again with Mozart's music. It's so glorious. All the music he uses in that whole thing made me just listen and go, how could this one person do all this? So I recommend it as a movie. Definitely, definitely check it out. Despite his short life, yeah, that's what's so amazing, his short life. He has some of the best-known opera symphonies, concertos, choral works in the canon. And my favorite thing about Mozart is I fell in love with the movie Vertigo with with Jimmy Stewart and Barbara Bel Geddes and Kim Novak. And when he has his episode, he's in the hospital and Barbara Bel Geddes comes to visit him. And she says, hey, Jimmy, I'm going to put on Mozart because it clears the cobwebs. And it's how I think about Mozart. It's clean. It's elegant. The chord structures are basic. All students who learn about music and they're learning chord structure in college in theory. They learn how, you know, rock and roll has transformed, been transformed from all these early composers from their chord structures. So it's really, it's really interesting. We'll play a little chord structure in a minute. It's a shining example of the classical style. Light, clear textures, predictable forms, with clear melodies and straightforward harmonies. The plot is the libretto by Emanuel Schikaneder, German playwright and impresario. Sometimes less frequent would a composer be the librettist as well. They often collaborated, and sometimes there are two librettists. When we get to our French later, we'll see that that's the case. The, wor the work premiered in September. Do I, is that the right slide up? Yes. September of 1791. Two months before Mozart's death, only two months before he died, this premiered, the, the Magic Flute. It's amazing. And if you've never heard Mozart opera, this is a great one to start with. It's got all, everything you want in an opera. It's a Singspiel. So basically that means it's a singing play. Dialogue is spoken. So it's, I always say to people, what's the difference between opera and Broadway and They'll go, I don't know, the music is modern, and I'll know most of the time this dialogue in Broadway and opera, the dialogue is sung. But once in a while, with operetta composers, light opera composers, and Mozart will stick dialogue in there as well. 
And so this is a Zingspiel, so there's dialogue spoken. And so because of Schixenator, this opera was in German, because Mozart also wrote some Italian operas, like Don Giovanni, and his librettist was Italian. The plot is interesting because it deals with Freemasonry as well as Enlightenment principles. So Freemasonry was is this group of guys, right? No women were allowed. That wouldn't fly today. Um, and they built themselves up to think that they had magical power. Um, and But the religion itself is Iranian in nature. And um, Tamino is the handsome prince. Sorry, he's another tenor. Oh, God, these tenors. If you got, can't be one, you better just love one. I mean, right? My goodness. So he's the handsome prince who's lost, is lost in this strange land and is being pursued by a monstrous serpent. Three mysterious women appear, because right, it's opera, so three women appear, right? Who are servants of the queen of the night and slay the monster. Afterwards, they give Tamino this portrait of this queen's daughter, Pamina, and he instantly falls in love with her picture. Hmm, that sounds like Tinder, right? Um, <laughs> vowing to rescue her from the evil Sarastro, pre priest of the sun. In those faraway temple, in the, in those faraway temple places, she has been imprisoned. The three women give Tamino the magic flute, hence the title of the magic flute, to help his quest to aid of a bird catcher named Papageno. And Tamino travels to Sarastro's temple to meet Pamina for the first time. After passing some trials that he's, are given to him by Sarastro, Tamino wins Pamina's love, and their engagement and her engagement by the queen to Monastitos is broken as the daylight prevails. So, Sarastro is at odds with Queen of the Night, and what's very fascinating about this is um, Sarastro has the lowest notes in the opera, and four octaves up, is Queen of the Night sings the highest note. So Sarastro sings a low F. Can you play that note that I sing? And Queen of the Night sings the F, up one, I think. Up one. Yeah. So that's what's, it's not all operas have that kind of range for the singers. So you have to pick certain people to, that you cast in these roles because of the difficulty. So, yes, I'm switching gears for this aria to sing as a bass. Um, and so this aria, Sarastro is the rival to Queen of the Night. They're a fighting. They're just old. They're just fighting. They're fighting. He believes Tamina was destined to be with Pamina, and the queen of the night doesn't want to be foiled, so she and the three ladies in Nanastatos throw a hissy fit, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They are, they are brought down to hell. And in this aria, Oesis Untosiris is actually evokes the gods of, of Isis and Osiris, asks them to protect. So this is, what's interesting is this is very hymn-like, and it's very church-like, and it's like a blessing for Tamino and Pamina. But, of course, there are no women around. Sarastro's with his guys at the masonry temple, right? So in the middle of his aria, the men sing exactly what he sung as a repeat. And I thought this would be a really good selection, some time to do with the Coachella Valley classical voices and have the wonderful men singers that I have sing in the middle. So will you play the melody for us that we're going to hear and that the men will sing after? So it's very chord-like. And if you listen to the opera and you hear Queen of the Night, her music's all running all over the place and she's just, ah! Because she has to make you f be scared of her, right? Um, and she uses her voice for that. So, 
Uh, this is the aria that Sarastro sings as a blessing on Tamino and Pamina. And it's sung in German. So we're going to stay with the Germans. Das Rheingold is one of four operas for the ring, right? Richard Wagner, 1813 to 1883, best known for the ring cycle, wrote his own librettos. Ah, here's one for you. Designed the concept of Gesamtkunstwerk, total work of art. The plot, Rheingold, is in the first of the four operas that makes the ring cycle. Last text to be written, Wagner wrote the operas in reverse order. And first to be performed, score was com performed score was completed in 1854. Premiered in 1869 against his wishes by his prisoner, by his patron, by his prisoner, by his patron, that would be interesting. The King of Bavaria. The cycle focuses on Siegfried, the hero of Germanic myth. Rheingold is in the prologue of Siegfried's tale, told in the following three operas, Die Valkyrie, Siegfried, and Götterdämmerung. Rheingold tells of the theft of the magical Rheingold and the forging of a ring by the greedy dwarf Alberich. He renounces love in order to gain the ring's power. But when the ring is stolen by Wotan, the leader of the gods, see, baritones aren't bad guys. They're gods, right? To pay the debt to the builders of his new fortress, Valhalla. 
Alberic confers a terrible curse upon the ring. Anyone who does not possess the ring will covet it, and anyone who does will live in fear of losing it and will ultimately be robbed of it and killed by its next owner. It takes four operas to tell this, let me tell you. And, it's, and when I was going to school at Conservatory of Music in San Francisco back in the 80s, um, there were Wagner crazed people. There was Wagner Society and they would get in somebody's apartment and they would stay and listen to all four operas all the way through and everybody would bring snacks and they'd lay around the floor and they'd eat and drink and listen to recordings of the ring. It's really, it's really spectacular when you start to hear all the light motifs, which are all the melodies. And when you're singing about somebody and their melody comes in, you go, do, 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 do. So Votan's the leader of the gods. It's a great name, Votan. Yeah, Votan. Has a castle built for his wife, Fricka, by giants who demand Fricka's sister, Freya, the goddess of youth and beauty, as payment. He assures his wife he will find another way to pay the giants, which is ultimately the ring made by Alberich. He steals the ring from Alberich, then Wotan is forced to hand it over to the giants. When he removes it from his hand, he realizes how terrible the ring's power is. Alberich, Abendlich strahlt der Sonne Auge, is the aria that I will sing from Wotan, comes near the end of the opera. Wotan's greeting to Valhalla leads the procession of gods into the castle, asks his wife if she likes it. She probably feels she's got some, you know, interior designing to do, but for now it's okay. And there's all kinds of, we're trying to find one light motif that we really like. And it's this glorious light motif that makes you feel like you've arrived. It sounds like this thing would be played at the opening of the Olympic Games. And this is the tune. I mean, it's just so glorious. And you can imagine a hunt. What's interesting about Wagner and Richard Strauss, actually, is their orchestras were larger. So it's harder for American opera houses to house a complete orchestra. There's often reductions of orchestra. Mind you, the big opera houses in America. But regional opera, they never designed pits that big. In Europe, you have a house with the audience this size and an orchestra pit to house 130. Because, of course, they're going to do all their Wagner and Strauss operas. So, unfortunately, I can't express to you how, what it's like to sing with the, that many... You know, you think, oh my God, you're not going to be able to hear me. My, you can't hear me against the 100... But there's something about, it's magical about how he composes the orchestra music so it doesn't drown out the singer, but that they sing and play harmoniously together. It's really fascinating. And... Bruce does a fantastic job because what Bruce's job is, was his, why his job is hard is he's taken the whole orchestra reduction that comes for, it's called a piano voice score, and he has to make it sound as close to an orchestra as he can with just a piano. So it's, 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 uh, it's an art form. You don't just, just not anybody can play opera. You have to understand the emotion that goes into it and, and how sometimes how it's big and sometimes how it's soft. So, but I digress, right? Um, I think we're ready to sing this now, aren't we? Okay, we're going to take you to Valhalla. <laughs> Oh. 
von morgen bis abend in Thank you. Susanna. Susanna. We're moving to American opera. Carlisle Floyd, 1926 to 2021. Contemporary American composer. Librettos were based on the life in the South. He was on the piano faculty of Florida State University, later received his master's in composition from Syracuse. Excuse me. He co-founded the Houston Opera Studio for Young Artists and is known as the father of American opera. And by the way, I'm going to stop here and tell you, you know, the Palm Springs Opera Guild is really awesome. They're giving out $33,000 in prizes to young aspiring singers coming up in the next few months. So it's one of the great reasons to join the Opera Guild and hang out with these people. And in the spring, they do opera in the park in down in downtown Palm Springs, and you get all these great singers, and it's a great party, and it's outdoors. So you can get more information from Lori Baldwin in the back. It's really a great organization. I just thought I'd say. Susanna is the second most performed American opera after Porgy and Bess. The plot, Floyd wrote the libretto based on a tale of Susanna and the elders. The story focuses on 18-year-old Susanna Polk, an innocent girl who is, target, who is targeted as a sinner in a small mountain community of New Hope Valley, in the southern American state of Tennessee. Susanna Polk, a wide-eyed and lovely young woman, lives a simple and happy life with her brother, older brother Sam, who raised her. She finds herself viciously ostracized by her small Tennessee village people after a group of church elders discover her bathing nude in a secluded stream near her home. Though her intentions were entirely innocent, she is painted as a sinner seductress by the elders, in part to conceal their own lusty feelings. Mm -hmm. And the entire town turns against her. A visiting preacher, Reverend Olin Blitch, <laughs> tries to force her into repentance to save her soul, uh -huh. but turns out 
he's far more of a devil. This is probably the worst guy I'm singing today. He's a bad guy. Because he ends up raping her. Oh, it's horrible. It's horrible. Yes, we're very careful if we do any scenes from this opera and we're going to churches. We're real careful about that. Um, and then, of course, he discovers that she was innocent and she was a virgin. So he begs her and the Lord for forgiveness. Ha, 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 fat chance. But instead, Sam, her older brother, says the heck with this and shoots him dead. For revenge, right? The town descends on Susanna's house to drive her out of town, but she stands her ground and laughs at them and pulls her shotgun out, and so they leave her alone, and the curtain falls, and the opera's over. <laughs> but I got to tell you, it's some great m melodies. Susanna, the trees on the mountains, or Ain't It a Pretty Night, those are two absolutely gorgeous soprano arias, heartfelt. I've, I've heard... Uh, uh, Renee Fleming sings them. Oh, they're just absolutely beautiful. And of course, Reverend Blitch's plea for help. Ha, ha, ha. So, let's see if we can get there. We are. We'll even put text up for you. But hopefully, I can sing in English, right? <laughs> All right. Get my preacher hat on. I beseech thee, I have called upon thee all night in vain. Thou hast gone from me, and my spirit has wilted like a morning glory when the sun comes. Return, O Lord, and hearken to my plea for forgiveness. Receive my confession, O Lord, and hear the words of my repentance. It's a horrible thing I have done. Forgive the weakness of my flesh, O Lord, and condemn me not to the eternal fire for the sin against thee and the woman. She was untouched, O oh Lord, she was untouched before her young body was defiled by my hands, defiled by my lust. Forgive me, O oh Lord, and grant her thy peace. Oh, forgive me, O oh Lord, and return unto me. Thou hast gone far away beyond the sound of my calling. Return and grant my tortured soul the balm of thy forgiveness. What shall I do if thou desert me? Not with the weight of the sin oppressing me, and condemn me not to the fires of hell. Return, O oh Lord, I pray thee, O oh, return, and let this come. If it be thy will, pass from me.
he's a bad guy. He's so fun to play, though. Oh, he so fun. carries around a Bible and a cross. Oh, it's so bad. It's so slimy. It's, I mean, those are the good guys. I mean, probably one of the, my favorite roles was Scarpia and Tosca. Because I love dying. I love dying. It's great. I used to pop like three blood pills in my mouth right before she stabs me. And I would try to lay myself so that my head was downstairs like this and I'd break the pills so the blood would come out of my mouth. (laughs) Theater, right? I mean, come on. You want drama? That's why the baritones are, you know, the bad guy. Well, or the the one with the the voice of reason, right? Okay. Oh, my gosh. Look who worked. Oh, now probably an opera you know. Okay, you'll probably have to all sing along with this one. Actually, a bunch of Coachella Valley classical voices are here today. So as you know, our concert's here on Wednesday night, the 18th. And you're going to hear, oh my gosh, all kinds of opera, quintet, quartets, two sextets. You're going to hear great Broadway quartets and, and, and big ensembles. It's going to be really great. There's 33 singers this year. right? Our debut was here last year. And BJ was, was, they were so excited because it filled up and they said, oh my gosh, people really want opera and Broadway. And I said, I hope so, because that's what we're bringing them. So please come. It's free. Don't we? And Jay, thank you so much for sponsoring all these programs. <laughs> Takes the arts, right? Takes the arts. You take the cake. All right. Georges Bizet. 1838 to 1875. Remembered as a shining example of romantic style. He was an early compositional prodigy and an excellent pianist. While he did not achieve great success while alive, boy, we hear that a lot, don't we, with all these guys, right? His operas are now an important part of the opera repertoire and the musical melodies are well known. I mean, not only is there Carmen, but there's the Pearl Fishers, that has the the beautiful male duet that everybody craves. I mean, it's really great. Carmen premiered in 1875, three months before Bizet died of a heart attack. (laughs) Haven't we heard that story, right? He believed that the work was a failure. He believed it was a failure. The plot, the libretto was by Henri Meliac and Ludwig Halevi, based on the novel of the same title by Prosper Merimé, written as an opera comique. So the dialogue separates the musical numbers, and the plot fell outside conventions and shocked and and scandalized the first audiences that heard it because it had realism. So it did that interplay of there being something funny, but there was actual tragedy during the opera. slides right here. The opera opens with Carmen and her fellow cigarette factory worker girls. They stream out each day into the courtyard. Local young men surround them and flirt, but Carmen explains her heart can't be tied down with in the unforgettable habanera. It's a beautiful tune. Everybody's probably heard this, right? Which begins with the words, love is rebellious bird that none can tame. When she is arrested for attacking another woman with a knife, she seduces a military lieutenant, Don Jose. And she she talks him into untying her and letting her escape, and she says, meet me later. And the pair become lovers. He's a tenor. (laughs) I'm waiting. He's a tenor. What can I say? He's a tenor. I guess Il Tabaro might be one of the few operas in the Tritico that she talked about yesterday where the baritone is actually the lover. But he still is a bad guy. He chokes the tenor. (laughs) Great moment. (laughs) Great moment. Just saying. (laughs) The pair become lovers and they run away. Run away from, and he runs away from the army to be with Carmen. But two months later, Carmen is tired of Don Jose and has turned her attention to the bullfighter as Camillo. In a fit of jealousy, Jose follows Carmen to the amphitheater where the bullfight is about to perform 
And he says, you're not going in. And she says, the heck I am. I'm going in. He says, no, you're not. And she says, yes, I am. And he stabs her. And he stabs her right as you hear in the background the tune I'm about to sing, which we all know and can sing along. So it's really a really incredible moment. Escamillo, so he's the dazzling bullfighter, right? He's both a baritone hero and an anti-hero. And of course, this is probably the most recognized tune in the opera, so we decided to give it to you today. And Voltortos describes his prowess as a toreador, and the chorus joins Escamillo on the refrain. The jaunty melody shows the, br the bravado and the confidence in which the bullfighter performs. And what's ironic is the chorus part really almost sounds like a military march, hence Don Jose. And will you give us that military march, please, that we're going to obviously hear in the piece. So earlier in the opera, the, they march off, the men march off to that, and even the little kids chorus does a funny ha-ha-ha-ha marching off to this tune. And then this comes in in the middle of the Toreador's song, who it's almost like he's taking over the rain. And it's, it's not about the military, but you hear, that's the leitmotif you hear. So here's Votrtost from Carmen. Je peux vous le rendre, Seigneur, Seigneur, car avec les soldats, oui, les torreurs peuvent s'entendre. Pour plaisir, ils ont, ils ont, ils ont, et frappent encore. Le cirque est plein ce jour de fête, le cirque est plein de tabac. Les spectateurs perdent la tête, les spectateurs sont de peine à grand fracas. qui s'est à page, pousse jusqu'à la fureur, car c'est la fête du courage, c'est la fête des gens de cœur. Hello, a garde. Hello, hello. Tore, ador, angadu. Tore, ador, tore, ador. Songe bien, oui, songe à combattre. Que ne noir te regarde et que l'amour t'attend. Tore adore, l'amour, l'amour t'attend. Et songe bien, oui, songe à combattant. Que ne noir te regarde et que l'amour t'attend, t'aurai adore, l'amour, l'amour t'attend, l'amour, l'amour. L'amour, Tore Ador, Tore Ador, L'amour, Tato, A garde. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Greek. And I wanted to really give you a baritone note, so I added a note at the end. That's not traditional. Right? It says it goes, to, to, re, ador, to, re, ador, l'amour. But I went, l'amour. I sang a G, which is a real typical baritone note. And I didn't have any other on the slate today, so I thought, oh, I have to give them a G, right? <laughs> so that they think baritones aren't bad people. Um, do we, we have time for some questions. Do we want to bring the lights up? I know one of my students probably has a question. <laughs> yes. Oh, thank you, my dear. How difficult it is to switch fox. So I've got to be careful when I say that word. It's F-A-C-H, fach. And a fach is a voice type. And... I sang, uh, uh, I think when I was younger, I could, when I was younger, I couldn't do this, but I could do it now because my range is, I know, I understand my range and I understand what to do with it, but it was okay. I mean, did I lose any notes today? Oh, I love it. <laughs> no, but yeah, but it, I, uh, you wouldn't do it in an opera per se, you know. You'd sing one part. And when you're rehearsing a production, you get in a groove with what you're doing. So if I'm singing, if I'm singing Scarpia and Tosca, I'm singing a certain way with Scarpia and I'm pacing it because he dies at the end of Act Two. Where when I'm singing The Flying Dutchman, the whole opening aria is 18 minutes. So you've got to really concentrate on pacing yourself. Even though The Dutchman is more like what I do because it's very rangy. It's real low, and it goes really high. It's a very unique type of, of thing. So, uh, The arias that you sang today, uh, did you play the roles on stage, any of them, and where? <laughs> where did you play Votan in London? I played Votan in San Francisco at Palace Legion of Honor, and I played a new production where the Rhine Maidens were on the beach. It was really funny. It was really fun. <laughs> And I was in a business suit, and my wife was decked out with all kinds of jewels. Um, and I did it because when you're young in your career, you kind of want to do projects like that to get the role under your belt and perform it once, so that if you get cast somewhere to do it, you kind of know what you're doing. Um, I've not sung Sarastro on stage, but I've sung Papageno many times, and I've sung the Sprecher. But I never really kind of have touted myself a bass bass, Sarastro and Magic Flute's really a base. Um, Toreador, no, but I've stage directed Carmen maybe six productions. I just never felt like he was my thing. I was more Figaro, Figaro, Figaro from Barbara Seville, although I did many Dr. Bartolos. I sort of liked the comedic part of, of those characters a lot. And uh, Susanna, I sang Blitch in... Billings at the opera company that I started. I cast myself. One of the few times I did. <laughs> so defined few. But I mean, I'm to the point now where I probably am, have directed as much as I've sung. Which is interesting because I take my hat off to singers because it's hard because the audience wants every perfect note and you're only as good as your last performance. Yes, op the audience is forgiving, but they want to hear those high notes, and you're, they have no idea what you're doing on stage if you're thinking about, okay, here I'm thinking about my technique, or I'm thinking about just opening my mouth and hoping it's going to come out on that day. You know, Today was a little bit of that just because it was different Fox, and I was going from high to low to high to low, and I'm thinking, okay, i got to gear the larynx differently. Here comes the next piece. Down low, low. And I had to get here for the high notes. So it's, it's you know, it's a journey. Yeah, you understand. You, you tenors. Yes, Paul. You mentioned the opera company of Billings, you said? Yeah. That's Montana, right? Yes. How big a community is that? 
It's 120,000 people. So that's, and that's about where like I grew our valley up. here, right? What? That's about like the size of our whole valley. Probably. They have a really nice theater there that seats 1,400. And I went home. Pablo Avira from the Met was deciding to put on Barbara Seville and Billings. And I'd done Bartolo all over the place in Barbara Seville. So he heard about me and asked me to come sing. And I thought, I'm going to go home to sing? Sure. Well, that night when it closed, they realized Pablo was not going to be the next artist, the first artistic director of an opera company. They asked me to be that, and I thought, go home, start an opera company, what could be better? And then my mother was still living there, and amongst the family members, we thought that was also a really good family thing. How many productions a season did you put on there? They'd, I did three big productions a year and then six weeks in the schools. And then we toured the state of Montana with a little opera called The Night Harry Stopped Smoking. We got lots of federal funding and, and, and medical funding for it because I was Fred and Ginger the dancing alveoli. And, you know, you learned about the lung parts and why you don't smoke. And it was really cute. It was really, oh, it was really cute. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you know. So it's not inconceivable that a community our size could support a small opera company. Is that like what that. you're getting at? That's what I'm getting at. <laughs> I was like avoiding that completely. <laughs> Listen, I think it's great what the Guild does. You know, I think, but I do also, I firmly believe, because I did it in Montana, I did it when I was at Opera Idaho there, and I did it at Rogue Opera in Medford. You have to get in the schools, because if I don't bring opera to, kids, not only grade school kids, but middle high and, and, and high school kids, if we don't get them to hear this, these art forms aren't going to live. I mean, it's great that we're getting funding, but we have to go. But that's, that's a little high horse I have. The group that I have, Coachella Valley Classical Voices, I'm already, just one year in, I'm working on how I can get select kids from high schools to sing with us so that they're around the opera, besides the Broadway. They get Broadway here a lot. But I want them to be around the opera singing, because when they do, their eyes get big, and they go, oh, this is cool. Oh my God, look what your voice does. And it sort of like takes the voice to a different level. you know. And plus, it's unamplified. It's the last art form of singing unamplified. Everything else is a microphone. I really don't. I, I wanted to get away from the mic and just let my voice go, because it's sort of like, letting the horse out of the corral. <laughs> well, you know, you want to just, you want to, because you know you can reach the audience better if it comes raw from, from you. Yes? Have you ever uh, heard Anna Russell's analysis of the world? <laughs> Absolutely. It's one of my favorites. I don't know. I never, don't have the CD. I owned the record at one time. Oh, my God, that's a great party. That's a great party selection. It's the Royal Maidens. I mean, they're in it. Oh, yeah. It's really great. Yes. That was, yeah, right. And then they start all over again. Anna Russell. Look her up on YouTube if you don't know anything about her. Oh, my God. She was a stitch. She was a stitch. Yeah, and, of course, I'm always all over when I notice that there's opera on commercials and opera in movies. And I find the European movies use classical music more than American movies do. They tend to do John Williams Star Wars type stuff, you know, which I love. They're beautiful, but I also, I'm eager to kind of keep the art form alive because it was how I made a living. I mean, you know, I, I had the best of both worlds. I, I was able to transition out of opera singing into, into teaching at a university and then running an opera company because at a certain point, it's hard to do this all, all the time. It's just hard. Your chords are only two, and and you got a you got a cocoon. And with COVID and everything, you have to really cocoon to be careful and and to have your voice. You can wake up and be ready to go and sing your be ready to go, and you can wake up and your throat says no, it's not happening today. Well, they're not going to not do the performance. So it's a real challenging. It's it's I you know I take my hat off to artists. Well, I think that's about our time, so let's take our hat off and say thank you once again to oh, Bruce go, and go, Doug. Go.